but I'm ready. Okay, welcome to the Regeneration Podcast. I'm Michael Martin here with my my podcast podcast partner, Mike Sauter. How are you doing, Mike? Good, Michael. Last uh, last episode, if we talk about anything today, you you dropped a bomb. You talked about vernacular sacraments. So I hope you can weave that in somehow today with our guest. <laughs> yeah. I like that phrase. I never thought. I'm of already that. on the index, Mike, but it's okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, so yeah, so today we're we're having our second interview with David Cayley, the great David Cayley, uh, who the more I know about, the more I like. <laughs> like I just found out right now, he he plays bluegrass, and which is scores you giant points in my book. And but to, you know, so last week we talked about a lot of things. We talked about William Blake, Ivan Illich. We talked a, a little about Simone Weil. Am I leaving anything out? We uh, did some uh, Rene Girard. Rene Girard, um, and and David, uh, his most recent book is uh, Ivan Illich: An Intellectual Journey. Right? Yes. That's right. That's the, and uh, I, don't worry, I get the titles of my own books incorrect. Well, that, wasn't, that wasn't the title I wanted. That was the title. Uh, isn't that highly? It, it was actually for years called A Candle in the Dark. Yeah. Uh, they, which but I sure thought was, I don't know. Academic was, presses they, like they boring it was an titles. Elton John song or something. Or it, was too <laughs> new, it was too new age, but it actually <clears throat> was faithful to its subject. I, I think, think so. so. Absolutely. But anyway, it doesn't matter. That's how academic presses roll. Yeah. And speaking of academic presses, uh, you have a blog post on your on davidkayley.com uh, um, asking the question whether Ivan Illich was a romantic. Oh, yeah. Which is where I... Now, did, did the press tell you to take that out or they say, we got this too big? You they didn't, they didn't tell me to take that out. The okay. book, uh, and, and here I would not question their judgment at all. The book was extremely long. <laughs> uh, I just wrote it. I didn't write it with any length or anything in mind, but to try and say what I felt I had to say. So I ended up pruning a lot out, and that was just one of the things that had to be pruned. Okay. Well, it, and I, that, the reason I, I bring that up because romanticism is a, a topic very interesting to me. In fact, in my book, mm -hmm. The Submerged Reality, I have. Uh, a chapter entitled the romantic the the noble failure of romanticism mm -hmm. um because like like you like so many like charles taylor you see there's something that happens with the rise of romanticism that still persists and and you had this question of whether or not Ivan Illich was a romantic, uh, a, a term which he rejected, correct? Yes, because he always used it colloquially, mm -hmm. and and it was uh, it, it was easy at a superficial level to identify him with romanticism in that colloquial sense. Deschooling society, give me a break. Yeah, uh, so <laughs> he he would always disavow romanticism. Yes. So, but so I, you, he, I don't think he ever seriously considered the question, am I, am I a romantic in the sense of William Blake or in the sense of Gary Snyder's great subculture, right? Which is, absolutely which makes romanticism in a certain sense, primordial anti-statism. Mm -hmm. You know, there's so many different meanings that it has. Which is, I mean, so, you also see that primordial anti-statism in Shelley and in your in your your, your uh, section on romanticism and Illich uh, you quote uh, Wendell Berry of all people right who the Canadian Wendell Berry quotes Wendell Berry <laughs> who and and Wendell Berry excoriates Shelley <laughs> yes Percy and that Shelley, wonderful right? essay and and uh, standing by words yeah and I mean, I can I, I can understand his criticisms, but on the other hand, Shelley died when he was twenty nine, <laughs> right? <laughs> what would have happened had he lived, you know, another couple of decades? Where where yeah, would he? Yeah, have, yeah. And I th and you can see in Shelley where he definitely developed over time. I mean, he gives us such a short life anyway, right? 
Yeah. So let me ask you, David, um, how would you define romanticism in the way we're, you're, you're, <clears throat> you're understanding it in a way that I think is also pertinent to our own moment? Well, I, I would, you will know this from that essay um, that I excised from the book, but I would say my two great teachers were Northrop Frye, who in a book on English, a short book on English Romanticism, which is not amongst his best known works, uh, describes Romanticism as an incomplete revolution, not, not a phase. Exactly the paralleling the title the, of Owen Barfield, right? right. Romanticism and, and, come of age. Yeah. And, and Barfield obviously somewhat under the influence of, of Rudolf Steiner, um, says the same thing. So if you think of romanticism as the, the great oppositional current within Western civilization, um, I, I guess that's how, how I would look at it. And if, if you take um, Fry's exposition of Blake, so what Fry says essentially is that Blake inverts the whole world picture uh, that he had inherited, you know, the, the top down hierarchical picture, God's up here, and then everything cascades down uh, through various levels. I can't remember if we spoke about this last week. We spoke about we Young and some of that, yeah. Yeah, so the world is to be remade, regenerated from below in Blake. Uh, and if that is romanticism, then I, th I think in a plural, culturally plural, historically plural, and temporally plural world, such as we now live in, we can only talk to one another if we begin at the bottom, right? Not with everything given as it were from the top and already cascaded down to us. So I already know, so why do I need to talk to you? Um, that, if, that, if that from the bottomness is romanticism, uh, then, then, yeah, then Illich was a romantic and I'm a romantic and- I'm a romantic uh, too. And, <laughs> They're all romantic. <laughs> Stand up and be counted. Yeah. Bottom up, bottom uh, up, bottom up. So, and it's probably quite an interesting lens uh, to to look through at at the whole contemporary scene. But I've never really tried to do it systematically. Well, you know, you know, because the word. I mean, the words are. I mean, the words that we use are systematically ruined right so even elementary conversation is is difficult until we understand what we're saying by the by with these ruined words um so yeah, I mean, romanticism is one of the things to reappropriate, re-understand. And, you know, one would like to talk to Wendell ab about Shelley. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but, to, link this, to link this to you, you know, and maybe it'll, it'll be where you could riff even a little bit more, David, is, um, you know, from the bottom up, if that's one of these themes, you know, you've interviewed people like William Kavanaugh and like, and in a different respect, John Milbank. <laughs> But you know, going on now, we're seeing that in the world we're living in, you know, that what we used to call the neutral public square is a religion and so forth. You know, what we're seeing in the Catholic Church for sure, people see that if everything's religion, you know, the crisis of liberalism, what what you're getting, you know, until we can get this bottom up William Blake thing, you know, uh, you get you get really wonderful people in his own way. Rod Dreher for so long was saying we don't know what happens next. Uh, Patrick Deneen, a political theorist here in the U.S., very brilliant. For so long was saying we don't know what happens next, but for the for the absence of the ability to consistently, you know, and I just I was writing down from my own notes, you know, talk from the bottom. P 
people are coming uh -huh. up with different versions of new theocracies, right? Yes, I think Milbank is. I know Kevin. I can't say is at all. He diagnoses the problem, but this bottom up thing. I, I know my dear friend here, Michael. I mean, we can't sing it loudly enough, you know. But yeah. if, until we clarify this, everybody's going to be advancing a <clears throat> new form of theocracy. Well, that's oh. probably right. I mean, my, you know, one of my <clears throat> resources is is uh, Hannah Arendt in her book on thinking, which is important to me, which is the first volume of The Life of the Mind, that mm -hmm. very late work, which was her Gifford lectures. Mm -hmm. And and there she she accepts this condition and that I talked about a minute ago and says, thinking therefore must always begin again, right? She uses the the image of Penelope's web, which she weaves and then unweaves in order to keep the suitors forever at bay uh, and until such time as Odysseus might return, uh, which I think we can't uh, overlook that possibility, but, but it hasn't happened yet. And so we, we are continually beginning again, rethinking. It could be understood as, as messianism minus the apocalyptic denouement uh, right. to live like that, to think like that. Um, well, and it, to me, it's, I mean, just to finish the thought, because I, I mentioned this book I'm doing on the CBC, that's the only way that the CBC could properly function would be in a, a taking a, a radical pluralism. Uh, as its starting point, and then mm -hmm. thinking of its work as 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 dialogue, as, as peacemaking, right? But as you know, Leonard Cohen says, "Let us compare mythologies," right? Mm. That everyone finally has a mythology, in the sense that the roots, the foundations of our thought are always somewhat unknown to us. The, the things that attract and, and direct our thought are somewhat unknown to us, right? We're always somewhat gripped by, by some shaping myth that we're only partially aware of. So peace lies in comparing mythologies rather than warring mythologies. Right. Um, uh, so end of sermon. It's wild. No, it's great. Here now, ends um, the lesson. Once it will. <laughs> no, I, and I think what, what all these people have in common with Blake, Shelley, uh, Novalis, who we didn't mention. Yes. Who also died young. Uh, Steiner and Illich is there were, they all of them had a project to reimagine society in, in their own ways, right? Uh, and what, what you and and I would say all of them were asking for an organic or bottom up version of that. Whereas what I see uh, in Mike mentioned Patrick Deneen and even in Charles Taylor and certainly a little bit in Milbank. Where, where I think there's a, and and I and I see romanticism in all those people, you know, strains of it, um, and I think uh, um, Taylor's book, uh, A Secular Age, uh, is just a, a remarkable journey through human development and consciousness over the last couple of millennia. Um, but I think their projects are more trying to fix what's wrong in, in what we've received. What, and, and whether that means going back to theocracy or, or something, but it's, it's, it's trying to work within the, that establishment. And I don't know if that works. Wow. You know, okay. It's, it's easier to me, for me to see John Milbank in that light than Charles Taylor. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but you might be right. <clears throat> 
Let me, it's just my observation because I was <laughs> in, a, in a secular age, I loved it, but like, well, what? So, where do we go from here, <laughs> Charles? Where do we go? Um, so now I here's a I have this an aside I wanted to bring up because it's a good, it's a great story. Um, I was at a conference, gosh, six or seven years ago at Loyola in Chicago. It was a big, uh, was it the return to religion or something title like that? Mm -hmm. And it all, all the heavy hitters in, in continental philosophy were there. Jean-Luc Marion was there, for instance. Uh, and in person, uh, what's his name? Can't remember his name. Uh, but Yulia Kristeva was supposed to be there. And I was so destroyed that she didn't show up. Of course, I probably saved myself some embarrassment because I probably would have gushed all over her. <laughs> Hi, love, oh, big fan. Uh, <laughs> big fan. But another person who was there was Thomas Altazer, the death of God guy. Yes. And yes. he had to be 88. He was very yeah. old because yeah. he died only a year or two after yes, that. Yes, he did, yeah. And he was there and he had, he had this uh, business card I used to, I don't know what happened to it. And it, it said, Tom Altazer, Apocalypse Now. <laughs> <laughs> and he, it, I don't think he presented a paper or anything, but he was just there as a gadfly. And uh, I can't remember who was giving a talk, but in the question and answer session afterwards, he said something that just dropped like a bomb for me. And he said, and I just want to tell you, William Blake, was a better theologian than anybody here. <laughs> and he was right. That's where I'm at right now. <laughs> I know, that's yeah. where I'm at. Yeah. And, and, and I, I even think with, you see in the death of God movement of the 60s that he was kind of you know, at the forefront of. And later with, with in con, the, with what's called the religious turn in co continental philosophy, where, which is what Marion came out of, it, and where Derrida moved from grammatology to theology. I mean, I think Derrida became a negative theologian in the last 20 years of his life. Um, so you see that even there, this attempt to reconfigure the inherited structures or understandings, the, the assumptions of I would say Western culture, which is even now, as, as David was just saying, it's essentially a religious culture, even though the, the object of faith may hit now, now it's secularism, but it's still a faith, right? You know, and so, but it's still the structure. And so it seems to me that these romantics we're talking about were saying, no, 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 no. We have to, whether it's Blake, with go within, but you know we turn, and I think we we see this also, and I don't know if it, you probably see this in Canada as well. Uh, this incredible um, development over the last, oh, probably quite a while, but it really exacerbated in the last few years. This incredible. Um, disdain in the the master culture for we can call it the peasantry or the working classes or just normal people uh where in the romantics if you go back to the to the 19th century they were like wordsworth in particular uh, were rediscovering the beauty of the peasant this is why uh um robert burns became a, a, a popular poet because people, you know, realized with the onslaught of the scientific revolution and the enlightenment that something extremely important was in danger of being lost. Um, and, and one other thing David has talked about and interviewed about is the commons, right? This idea of the commons, and I've written about it too. And just this last summer or last winter semester, I taught a course on romanticism. And one of the things that struck the, the students most deeply was uh, the work of the English poet, John Clare, who was 
he was more Robert Burns than Robert Burns. He was really an impoverished farm hand. He was he didn't even have his own farm. Mm -hmm. And he wrote a lot about the commons. And, and I and I think what we've seen over the especially over the course of, of my life and the course of the last few years is if you go back in the history of the commons, you, you go back to Thomas More in Utopia, writing about the sheep eating men, which is what was they were started to enclose properties then to throw the poor people off. By the time it came to the Industrial Revolution, this is why Blake was talking about um, all the horrors he saw in London and in, in his poem London, right? And and how uh, in the Marriage of Heaven and Hell, as we mentioned last time, the uh, prisons are built with the stones of law, brothels with the bricks of religion. He saw uh, what was happening by all these poor farm workers who are just working at subsistence levels. Once the enclosure laws happen, they're driven into the city like, I wouldn't say like cattle, but they're driven into the city and living in absolute squalor. The Industrial Revolution, you have children age of four chained to machines for 14 hours a day. And if they die, who cares? These are the things that's, that Blake saw and was outraged about, which is why he spent so much time about chimney sweeps, right? The same kind of thing with the chimney sweeps. They were, they were orphans, and if they die, so what? We have more, right? Dickens later talked yeah. about this quite a bit, yeah. right? And But I think what's happened is then the enclosure has moved from farmland, and now it's moving increasingly into the human body itself. If we think about vaccine passports or things like this, right? So what's being closed out? We're enclosed because we're, we're being farmed for data at, and, and so forth. Um, now, my next question is, you know, and we've also seen uh, these structures where this has happened in the church itself. I mean, and I mean, when I say the church, I don't mean the Catholic church, I mean the Christian church at large. Um, and, and so my question for David is, and, and, I, and, I, and I love what you said last time about you, you feel an affinity for Simone Bay, who's kind of standing right there at the threshold of, of Christianity and everything else. Mm -hmm. But, and, and, and it's, and I would, I would almost describe, you know, your work as in a way Christ haunted or, or, or Christendom haunted or something like this. Even the, the interview you did with George Grant. And I think I might be the only American to read George Grant on a regular mm -hmm. basis. Good. Yeah. He's, yeah. <clears throat> so, so my question is, so where do you see these kinds of things we're talking about in relationship to this thing called Christianity? Well, when I put those programs on the air that were eventually called the corruption of Christianity, <clears throat> I had called them the corruption of the best is the worst because that was overarching idea and, and the term that Illich himself had proposed, my executive producer who, uh, bless him. <laughs> <laughs> I, You're always blessing of, people who change your titles. None, none of this would have <laughs> happened without him, but he didn't, he thought that was impossible. It had to have a perspicuous name and he proposed the corruption of Christianity. And I responded, but Christianity is it's not Christianity is not what is corrupted. Christianity is the corruption. It's the ism that's the corruption, right? So what is Christianity if it's not an ism? The French is better, right? They actually say Christianisme. Mm -hmm. uh, you can't say an itty as easily as you can say an ism in English, mm -hmm. but without the itty, what is it then, right? I just I just finished um, a wonderful 
book that I, perhaps you know of him and I hadn't known of him until recently, a, a, a Sioux American uh, called Charles Eastman, oh. who uh, was the first of his people to, to gain a full mastery of English and of Western civilization generally, who, uh, but whose upbringing was entirely uh, traditional. He had, he had been brought up to be a traditional man of his people and a warrior. And indeed he was about to embark on the war path at age 15 to avenge, as he thought the hanging of his father for his part in the Minnesota uh, outbreak, as it was called, of uh, the of 1862, when a lot of settlers were killed. But just at that moment, his father returned a Christian convert and told his son that this was impossible, that it was going to be necessary to take. He said, I know our way of life is the best, but this has happened and we must take it on mm. and make our way in it. And Eastman made his way in it all the way to Dartmouth and then to medical school, and then became a pretty well-known writer uh, of books like The Soul of the Indian, Indian Boyhood, From the Deep Woods to Civilization, and so on. And this, what I read was an anthology selecting from these works. I was extraordinarily impressed by it. But he said that, um, once he had taken on the Christ ideal, that was his expression, uh, that he began to see that this was very much the same as the religion of his people. He, he translates what is often called great spirit. Uh, I think in the Sioux language from Wakan Tanka, I think Black Elk says great spirit. But he says great mystery, which is mm. sweet and beautiful. Uh, but he says that he, he thinks the ideas were very similar. Um, and particularly the and particularly stressing the attitude to property. Uh, and um, so he's a Christian, right? He identifies Christianity as, as what his people were practicing. It's, it's made luminous in the Christ ideal. Uh, it, perhaps it's made especially luminous or exemplary, but it's there already. I think, I think that was Illich's attitude in, in his writings on mission. Uh, he says, in a little essay called The American Parish that he did in the early 50s when he was himself an assistant parish priest, that every Christian must by definition be a missionary. I don't know if he says that explicitly, but you know, if you, if you have good news, you're gonna share it, or it's not really good news uh, if you don't wanna share it, but how do you share it? Um, so his, his, his thought is, is the missionary, the sharer, you don't even want to say the missionary necessarily is, understands what is meant by poverty of spirit, understands that he is a stranger and an idiot vis-a-vis -vis the other culture and is looking to see what lights up within the other culture, uh, what, what resonates with what he, she thinks they have. Um, so I, I don't think we really, I mean, we can look throughout history and find all sorts of luminous examples, right? Uh, from today 
uh, all the way back to the beginning. Uh, there were Christians, right? But he's 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 says something wonderful at the end of one of its books. He says that he he thinks that um, he he meditated for thirty years on the absence of Christianity amongst the Christians. <laughs> Since had you know he took the project on he took the project seriously. This is civilization. It must inevitably prevail over a way of life that is has the possibility of it has vanished, right? He he didn't think the cultures would necessarily die, but the the way they had lived would would not be for much longer available, and already wasn't available uh, as far as the plains Sioux were concerned, because the the buffalo were gone. But even for the woodland so of Minnesota, from where he came, it was the same. <clears throat> so he took it on, but he was astonished. And I think seriously thought about it. And he, he says at the end that, that the Christians are very eager to impose their religion on other people. And he thinks perhaps because they want to get rid of it. So they, won't have, they won't have to follow it themselves. Um, <laughs> they want to get rid of it. Yeah. It's a very witty. Uh, it's a very witty and profound saying, actually. Yes, it, it is. So that's a long, long way of saying I have no idea, Michael. Okay, good. But I, I, I think. <laughs> Neither do I. Uh, <clears throat> I believe there's. I mean, one of okay, uh, one more attempt. One of my go-to's is the Tao Te Ching in a translation made by an American poet called Witter Binner, which was published as The Way of Life, I think in the late 40s, perhaps. Mm -hmm. okay. It's a free translation that he made. He wasn't Chinese speaking. He worked with a Chinese scholar. Um, it's, it's a book I came across a little bookstore off Harvard Square in the spring of 1966, and I literally vade mecum in the Latin. It's gone with me ever since. <laughs> yeah. And it's a uh, it's it's pure, and this Simone Weil says this also. It's pure Christianity, in the sense that it is a philosophy of the way, right? So. Um, what this what this will be in a hundred years it's beyond me you know I, I find the gospels completely contradictory um, I, I've written about this a little bit in the Illich book I'm, I'm no theologian and I'm no New Testament scholar either I think you're lucky but I, 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 think, you. yeah. I think that uh, I mean, to just take one fundamental contradiction, did it have to happen? Um, it seems as if Mary was free in relation to that angel. She might have said, no, sorry, I'm busy. <laughs> and then what? I have a career. <laughs> <laughs> I just got a new job, you know, whatever. Um, and so, but elsewhere, this has to be, search the scriptures, Jesus says. Have you not read? This is all foretold. This is all planned. This is the way it's all planned. It's all planned out. And that, that plan, which then becomes the Christians taking it to the world in the strange, evil, and paradoxical form in which Charles Eastman had to deal with it, is, is written into that part of the gospel that says this is all planned. Mm -hmm. But there's also another gospel. I, I mean, I'm way over my head here, which doesn't, which says the opposite. 
which and, and that's and that's what Illich says, which I I believe, although he always claimed he was perfectly orthodox when he says that the incarnation is remains and cannot exist as anything but a surprise it is it remains and cannot exist as anything but a surprise i think that must be a heterodox statement it completely contradicts the idea that this is foreseen yeah planned and that Jesus is essentially God's puppet. Um, and I, I don't see how we can, both ideas can be entertained as something other than a contradiction. They may both be true, and that may be the closest we get to the truth is the contradiction. It may be that, as Nicholas of Cusa says to us, that within these bounds, these horizons we live in as enfleshed beings, God will always appear to us as a complex of opposites. Therefore, both will be true. But at least one needs to acknowledge um, that we're facing pure contradiction. Right. Um, so how, how does then one proceed? What is the church? without its doctrine, it needs its doctrine. It must have its doctrine. Dogma guides uh, the credulous and is necessary. Fine. But also there's the opposite. There must be, so, and that, that was Illich throughout his career, right? The church as she, the church as it. They, they exist together. They must exist together but but both have to be given their due and and they must not be at war right constantly the one trying to the spiritual religion trying to drive out the dogmatic religion or the dogmatic religion trying to suppress suppress the spiritual religion right right endless warfare because we haven't ex accepted the fundamentally contradictory character of what's given to us to live. <clears throat> Over to you. Fascinating. Yeah. Um, I was just, what's, I'm trying to remember the, uh, Rosemary Houghton. Do you know sure. her? I do. Yeah, yeah the, the Catholic thing. And, that, and she says the same thing that David was just saying about where, how Illich put it in terms of she and it. Uh, Houghton puts it in terms of Mother Church and Sophia. H a u g h t o n. Yes. Yeah, you'll like her, David. You really will. The oh, yeah, Transformation will. of Man is another just fantastic good. book. Yep. Good, good. The Catholic thing is, and 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 that's kind of an interesting, and it, and I think it's interesting that. We, not including Illich, because he was kind of there the whole time. He just changed his perspective. But um, all the figures we talked about so far, Blake, uh, even Steiner, Novalis, Simone Weil, they all, and, and you can also say the same thing. And this is what's interesting to me, to me about phenomenology is so many phenomenologists, just like these romantics, through whatever that practice or those practices were that, that they adopted had a Christian turn. It might not have been an Orthodox Christian turn. It might have, might, might have been very heterodox, but they each had one, you know, which is undeniable. It happened to Edith Stein, for instance, right? It happened to Husserl. <clears throat> uh, because I think, and, and that I've written about this a lot. I mean, somehow. I was going to say this is kind of your project. You know, well, our engagement yeah, yeah. with you know yeah, our the real a, con a contemplative engagement with the world, and that could be liturgy, it could be nature, it could be the arts, could be anything. Eventually, uh, leads to an opening. I know Heidegger. Heidegger did the same thing, right? He doesn't use Christian terminology, but this is what he's talking about in, when he talks about disclosure. Right, how being thrown towards death, you know, 
you know, you stop running away from that eventually, if you do, and you come to disclosure. And what is the result of, of disclosure for Heidegger, but care, mm -hmm. you know, it's some kind of authenticity in your relationship to whether it's nature or other human beings or all of, all of the above. And I, you see the same thing in, or a similar thing in Simone Weil, when she finally exhausts communism and Marxism and all that's left is the cross, right? And or Christ comes down and takes possession of her, you know, um, which, and for her in, in particular, I mean, it was, she's like the last person who should be a Christian mystic according to, according to her, her, her uh, resume. But Hold on, she said that. She come, yes. Yeah. But she became. Right. Nevertheless, and, and I think Blake's turn in Jerusalem, you see that as well. I mean, and I, and, and what is that, right? What is that? And, and you mentioned, uh, what's his last, Charles, what was his last name? Oh. Eastman. Charles Eastman. Eastman. Well, and, and you mentioned Black Elk. Well, he, yes, so was his uh, given name, as a, but he, he did have one white grandfather, I think, who was called Eastman, so he took that Okay, name. well, Nicholas Black Elk. Same thing happened to yes. him, yeah. right? Same thing happened to him. And it's funny that people who read Black Elk Speaks have no idea he became a deacon in the Catholic Church. <laughs> yeah. And you just tell them like, wow, I'm kind of disappointed now. Uh, but, but there's something there. There's something that is disclosed and revealed that and for all those people is undeniable. You know, and, and, and that's what, you know, Mike and I, in our discussions in my project for the last seven or eight years has been to explore what that is. Yeah. And, and what do we do with that? And what is the, and as David was saying, what's the relationship to that insight or that understanding to the structural business of Christendom or the Christian churches, right? Which it seems often, as David was saying, in conflict. Well, Mike urged you at the beginning to speak about vernacular sacraments. Uh -huh. And I have no idea what you mean by that, but I can guess. And you go, David. Yeah, I think it's very it, evocative. Um, I want my it own. seems to me yeah. that that's simply what is given to me to live, right? I can't. Um, they very often said that, she, you know, she couldn't really budge an inch off the place she was at the intersection of Christianity and not Christianity or off what her experience so far had led her to believe up to the point of her conversion. I mean, we, we take what's given to us, right? So, um, so I, I'm not very comfortable in churches. I'm not very comfortable with the prevailing liturgies. And I find uh, there was an incident, this is a long time ago, but I was always, I, I grew up a, a deep Anglican with clergy and theologians in my background and and the, my family were very deeply part of the Canadian Anglican Church and having your imagination formed in that milieu you are constantly tending to try and return but one of these attempted returns was to a little congregation in Vancouver in the middle 70s and one day I, I came home from church and <laughs> And my wife said to me, how come you're always in a worse mood when you come back from church than when you go? <laughs> <laughs> and it, it hit me pretty hard. I thought, well, she's right, you know, and I know why, because I'm, I'm wrestling the whole time with the creed, right? With, with the creedalism, right? With the whole... Um, the whole design of it. And, uh, 
I mean, a later version of that, uh, and this is much more recently, I would, I would go to church with my father, um, who died about 10 years ago. And, and then I would find myself not in that young man, not, but still kind of alternately estranged and in tears. I mean, literally so moved by the beauty of it. So estranged from it. Um, and I think that's just the con condition one has. So uh, I, I guess I practice vernacular sacraments. Right? I, I find communion outside of the institutional church. What's a, to interject diligence again, David, like how do you describe, I don't have the book in front of me right now, but you know, it sounds, and Michael and I, even before you signed on, you know, Illich at a key point, and you mentioned, I think it's from the Vanishing Clergyman, and you certainly mention it in the intellectual biography. Uh -huh. I've recently seen it picked up in a book from the 60s by an Englishman. It's called, um, it's a book on the Holy Spirit, I forget, but he invokes it too. You know, that uh, a table, prayer of thanksgiving, a prayer of consecration. You know, yeah. most people listening will just say, oh, God, you know, this is this kind of like back to the early church. You know, unpack that a little bit for your knowledge of Illich, because I have my own kind of thoughts on vernacular sacraments before even Mike tells, you know, I just find the phrase uh, such a great touchstone. Well, well, what Illich thought was that the, the church was a, a, a giant, a, a, a sclerotic bureaucracy, a, a giant that totters before it begins to fall, he says in one of his essays. So he, he, he imagined a de-clericalized church. Never questioned the role of bishops, um, but he deeply questioned the role of clergy. He, he thought that the sacraments, uh, you know, that communities could find their own ways to celebrate in their, in their own, yeah, in their own mm -hmm. settings, right? Um, and that the the one called to do it would be able to perceive the call right that the community would know who should preside at the celebration it didn't have to be a, a priest appointed by the diocese right um so it it has a hugely increased element of spontaneity and a hugely increased element of vernacular or popular or inherent judgment, right? Um, that that's how people would, would, would live together. Um, Do you think he would have said it in any way differently at the very end of his life? No, not that, no, I don't think so. No, 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 no I don't do I. think so. I mean, he, he lived all, he people lived, might really he book. lived yeah. uh, he, Ivan lived always in community yeah they were often improvised communities that you know some there by affinity some there astray <laughs> strays you might say uh but always always in community and always in in celebration so to me it, it was always a model mm -hmm. Of, of Christian celebration, but not needing to call it, it was an advantage that it didn't need to call itself Christian celebration in the sense that the greatest enemy of Christianity is Christianity. Uh, you can't, you have to name it, you have to be aware that in naming it, you already institutionalize it. I mean, it's, it's that's the beginning of, of wisdom, right? Mm -hmm. And why Illich always preached awareness, not not some completed utopia where you're you're pat you've 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 got past you somehow you've solved the contradiction you've untied it you've you've 
you've synthesized it, whatever it is that you, now you're finished, right? The same illusion that Vey sees in the Christian church as it begins to gather speed, right? That it has, it's got everything it needs, it just has to work out a plan for imposing it on everybody else, <laughs> uh, right? Yeah, mm -hmm. what she calls the system of pedagogy, system of pedagogy, That's which what is, is a, yeah. a wonderful word in the circumstances, because of course, the, the one of the nets in which we're bound is the net of education, right? Amen. What's well, a uh, system of control, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so anyway, I don't know. I mean, yeah, I and I was we, glad you answered that because in the we just live, the we books, just live, yeah. right? Yeah, we just live. Yeah, in, in the context of the biography, you know, and like you, having read Illich for so many years, we might wonder that when he wrote The Vanishing Clergyman, was he just the floatsam on the excitement of the 60s or something, right? But you're, that's why I thought fairly important to at least get your informed opinion that would he have, I don't think so, would he have drastically changed this? You know, well, I don't he, think he ever changed in the no, slightest no, about No, 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 nor do I. He nor just I. became... He lived in the moment. Yeah, and and he was a sensitive man. Um, I've even said clairvoyant in certain ways, uh, and um, so in the last part of his life, he was somewhat seized by what what was coming down. Yeah, uh, in the new age, uh, whether you call it the cybernetic age or the age of information or the computer age or speak of it as michael did as as the enclosure of the body because it's deeply internalized right and myself as a system as an element in an immune system all, all this kind of stuff it preoccupied him and he hmm. what what was salient was not the the hope that had been so much a keynote in in the 60s and, and into the 70s right? he saw you know he was so historically minded when i think of those terms you know vernacular sacraments too that you know you're mentioning illich's you know, he's a prophet of techno feudalism you know the, the system stuff and he you know that being historically minded you know he did see the incarnation happening in you know the center of history in one sense right and that i wonder when I think of vernacular sacraments, you know, at the end of last week's, I mentioned the Coventry Patmore maxim that the Eucharist was a meal so that every meal might become a Eucharist. But, you know, I'm thinking of people like Charles Williams who talked about, you know, we've, we're only 2000 years after the incarnation and we're getting the increasing ingodding of these things. But if you're looking for poetry in the way that grace works in this world, as the world is becoming more etherealized in the form of systems, um, in these kind of tyrannies of schooling and so forth. Yeah, you know, vernacular sacraments, you know, it just ties in so much with what Michael's talking about, the real. Um, you know, that's just what I feel. Yeah. Well, if I can pick up something in what you please, just said, please, it, yeah. it, it responds to something <clears throat> Michael said or asked about earlier. When you say the incarnation is the center of history, I mean, it's a very ambivalent statement. Um, because it's 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 true in two senses. Triggers something. It's it's true uh, for faith, but it's it's also true historically. I mean, it's and that was important to Illich, right? That is, it's manifestly true, but as the mystery of evil, right? Right. That that. The faith, corrupted, produces the worldwide society uh, that we now live in. It, it, it just never it doesn't seem to me there's any question that that it came through Christianity, that it came through Europe's project of colonization. And one of the one of the great difficulties we're in is in denouncing that 
uh, contemporary movements also in a certain way ignore it, right? They, they want to rem they, they want to somehow remove it or or fail to acknowledge it uh, and also to fail to acknowledge their part in it, right? Mm -hmm. So you get these crazy hyper Christian discourses that what Rene Girard called super Christianity, right? What seizes people once they think they've overcome Christianity, but they're actually living in, in a congealed form of Christianity. They're, they're living in a society that was made, that, that was elaborated in these terms. So it's, it's a most confusing situation. And uh, I think unless it's fundamentally clarified, um, there's, there's not really much hope of moving, uh, yeah. of, moving uh, yeah. of, of, a, of a new way of thinking emerging. Yeah. Let's put it that way, because I don't, don't want to talk about the future. No, we got these secular uh, religions and, you know, but it's a, yeah. also a great, we had mentioned last week and Michael can, you know, handle a segue, but is it a, is it a good time to talk? You know, both of us want to pick your brain on, you know, Illich was so great on schools and medicine, you know, and when you were talking about super Christianity, you know, some people are justifiably thinking of the excesses of wokeism and so forth, but also something that interests all of us a lot was the peculiar transformations that took in society with the, you know, the advent of COVID and that whole thing. How would you phrase it, Michael? And on the chair, well, um, yeah. <clears throat> well, well, to back up a little bit, I'd yeah. say, you know, my, my own, a journey toward this understanding of what I'm calling vernacular sacraments started in the church. Um, and so this is maybe 10 or 12 years ago. Uh, we were attending a Byzantine Catholic church and our pastor was an elderly guy, but bad health. And he was really sick and it was Easter and he was almost collapsing on the altar. He made it to the consecration, but and I have nine kids, so all my kids were there. I, a couple of my kids might have been altar boys. <clears throat> and uh, right before the distribution of communion, one of the an eighteen year old altar boy comes out there. Hey, Doctor Martin, uh, Father wants to know if you can come up and distribute communion. I'm like, on Easter? That's like asking me to to quarterback in the Super Bowl. <laughs> <laughs> <That's right>. <laughs> <laughs> so I went up there, and in the Eastern Church, you distribute communion with a spoon and i was really nervous and i was shaking and but i made it through and when we got to <laughs> after after church on easter there's a blessing of baskets so they you bring your your easter meal in a basket and the, the priest blesses and when we were there a friend of mine comes up to me and he had cans of beer in his basket and he hands me a can of beer he says this is to help you with those shakes <laughs> so so it started, and I felt horrible that I was like, God, this, I'm not supposed to be doing this. And there was a Franciscan monastery near where I worked, and they had confession every hour on the hour. So I, I slipped in there to go to confession, and I just wanted to talk to this priest about what happened. I said, just, you know, I just felt like I wasn't worth being, I shouldn't have been there. Yeah. And, he's, and the priest said, yeah, I understand, but you know what? Jesus could have picked better men than the, than the apostles, but he didn't want better men. He wanted those men. So Jesus picked right. you. Right. And which kind of changed my perspective about that. That and it started to change it, I should say. And then after a while, the, we stayed at the church for a while. The priest gradually declined and he would have me do the gospel reading sometimes, which is a big no-no you know, in the, in the church, but why is it a big no-no? Yeah. Because it is, that's the only reason, right? And then, I mean, basically at one point I was doing everything except for the consecration. I was, <laughs> <laughs> I was seriously, I would, he would have me incense the church and everybody thought I was a deacon, I'm not. Um, and then at his funeral, 
I went to serve on the altar for his funeral because, you know, he was like a grandfather to my kids. And a couple of my, my, my sons were with us, with me on the altar. And so when it's a priest funeral, they bring out the bishop comes, a bunch of other priests come. So their bishop's there. And this one kind of renegade priest, he was a re- very much a Catholic worker priest. And he had been our pastor years and years before, but he no longer had a church. And he was there and he comes over to me at the kiss of peace, which is not given to the, to the faithful in the Eastern church, but priests give it to each other. And he came over at the kiss of peace and gave, gave me the kiss of peace. And he looked at me and said, you deserve this more than these guys. They have no idea what you did for this parish. <laughs> and they all stared in, in shock. <laughs> That's nice. We're going to have, we're going to talk after, after liturgy. Uh, so so I, you know, I, I had a, I, I think those those things started to, to soften my thinking, or the hardness of my thinking about what sacraments and about authority and all these things are in in, in the Catholic tradition anyway. And then when COVID hit and churches were closed, Easter was canceled, and I had still have. Uh, at the time, oh, I still have four kids living at home, or five at that time. You had Zoom masses, Doctor Martin. You had Zoom masses. Oh, I, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that was the answer. Stop me. Yeah, take me now, Jesus. But uh, so eventually, we had went through about a year of this, and we started just doing prayers and stuff on Sundays. And then it was Holy Thursday, and. My one son in his homeschool curriculum, he was doing the Old Testament. So we were going to do Passover. So we did a, we did a Passover f- for him. And I realized, and, it, and it's a kind of a Christianized Passover. I said, basically, we're doing the Eucharist. So I told my wife, I think, I think we should start just do it at home. Which is a huge step for me. I'm mean, huge, huge. I didn't think I'd ever get there, but, but I, I call it the Holy Spirit. But I felt called to this these vernacular sacraments, and and then we we like I've mentioned many times on on this podcast before. We around before that we started really making a big effort to celebrate the Christian festivals on our farm, meaning. Even though May Day is not a Christian festival, it's Christian enough. So we do May Day and St. John's Day and Michaelmas and Twelfth Night um, to to bring a sense of conviviality and and a recognition of the intersection, at least in the Northern Hemisphere, of the agricultural cycle and the church church year. You know, which I think is so rich, and I think one of my patron saints in this regard is is the Anglican poet Robert Herrick, who, uh, who, who, is, who embodies this kind of idea of, of vernacular sacraments. Of vernacular, I, mean, Illich, I don't know if Illich knew him, but he would have loved him because everything is in his poetry. It's, you know, it, they were Anglicans, but he's got the Virgin Mary in there. He's got the rosary. He's got prayers to the Lares, you know, so he's pagan, he's, he's Christian pagan, he's English pagan, he's Catholic, he's Anglican, he's every, he's everything to everybody. And he's also writes epigrams about beautiful girls and epigrams about annoying parishioners, you get, you, you have to love, right? Um, so those, those things all kinds, of, kind of nudged me in this direction of thinking about this. And then necessity, I think, pushed me into it. Um, and, 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 and like David said, you know, I'm still, you know, working out the relationship of what we're doing. And in fact, what we, we use parts of the, the book of common prayer in doing this. And so, um, but how can we, um, bring this devotional life connected to the real? Because my my problem, you know, with with churchiness forever, it was that um, I never felt like, like David. Like, I always felt like it didn't quite belong. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? I want to belong. I would like be nice to belong, but I don't feel like I belong. 
And, and I think Dorothy Day called that the long loneliness, right? Yeah. And I don't, but it doesn't have to be a long loneliness. Mm. Um, and I, I think there's, there's a richness and importance to human flourishing to be found in conviviality that's both, um, I, I would call it maybe characterized by both religious or devotional customs and folk customs. You know, I think there's, and I think that's uh, with Charles Eastman and Black Elk, they didn't throw out the Indian. They saw the, their Christianity is a fulfillment of that, right? Yeah. Or as Christ would say, behold, I make all things new. Yeah. And, and so I, 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 I'm yeah. really attracted to that idea of, of a, a religion attracted to folk traditions. And now <laughs> Christ wasn't the problem. Yeah. <laughs> for Charles Eastman, the Christians were a problem. Yeah, yeah right. that's right. Yeah, you could say it that way. That's right. So, but you were, Mike, you were also proposing the theme of what the last two and some years have meant, I think. You know? Yeah. Yeah. So, I, in, re, in response to what you're saying, Michael, I, I mean, I, um, one of, let me see if I can bring this together. So vernacular, um, one, of, one of our inspirers was a Norwegian a friend also, but an inspirer was our Norwegian criminologist by the name of Nils Christie, who, was a, who I knew through Illich. Um, and Nils wrote a, an essay that was published in the British Journal of Criminology, I think around 1976 called, called uh, Conflict as Property, which was a very, down to earth reflection on the way in which the institutions of criminal justice steal conflict from communities and in the process steal the capacity to become communities by having to deal wild with wild the, the yeah. sinew of, of community is is the ability to deal with what presents itself to the community but if the if the police swoop in and then privacy takes care of the rest because the police can't even tell you what's just happened on your street because that's private, sorry, sir. We're not allowed to disclose that, right? It's completely stolen. So um, my wife, Yuta was very much inspired by Nils and, and began to work in our local park, building various things there um, but always operating uh, on the basis of what I came to think of as one step at a time. So on the basis of what's there and what you can do with what's there now, here, and you don't imagine two steps because you don't know what the second step is until the first step is taken. Agreed. So it seems to me that's really the essence of, of understanding providence or even understanding messianism is that you don't, you must understand what is present now, what is available now. Uh, the, and, and act out of, present abundance, however meager it may currently be. So, so I think that that's important. And, and obviously you, some of this has, has come to you through what happened when you were, when you were called to the altar and so on. And, and, you know, for me, it's different for Mike, it's different, but it's always just taking that step. Ivan has a phrase somewhere in which he talks about the Christian compulsion to do good, or maybe it's the American compulsion to do it's good. Very American. I think it's. I think perhaps it's American. He says, yeah. but but behind that, subliminally, is, sure, is, absolutely, it's Christian, and and that's always stuck with me, right? That that you 
um, Christians in a way can't help themselves. They, they seem to be always ahead of themselves. Um, and, and their Christianity leads them <laughs> ahead of themselves or beside themselves yeah. or somewhere other than where they are. Mm -hmm. So that seems important. The second thing about COVID is to try and answer what you said, Mike, is that I think fundamentally um, it's the, the moment at which the religion or religiosity, Ivan said, of life stands fully revealed. For before, sure. Before us. So Ivan, you probably know this story, right? He he was he became interested in in, in this and, and in the 1989, I think, yeah, you know, addressed a Lutheran convocation in Chicago saying, you know. This is the greatest idol the church has faced in its history is this understanding of life as a substantive, as something, something that we're responsible for, that we manage, that is in fact a resource, as you hear in the phrase human resources, right? Which uh, can be fully administered even now in Canada, death is now administered by doctors um, through a bureaucratic process. Um, and so this has been coming for some time. And Ivan spoke of it as a new phase of religiosity um, and didn't get much of a hearing, I think was not really understood and felt he had, I think died thinking he hadn't been understood at all. But I think in the last two years, you see it fully. Mm -hmm. I mean, that, right. that my neighbors belong, most of my neighbors and my friends. I mean, this is, this is not something, this is not an affair of the <laughs> others, right? Yeah, this no, is, no, this no is for, no I'm, for nobody. This is where I'm living. Yeah. Uh, I'm living in a new religion that both worships and feels a responsibility to manage life and, and slides easily and unconsciously between the two functions as if they were the same function. So reverence, life on earth, save the planet, right? At one minute and the next, you really should have that knee operated on because it's defective and you can get a better one. Uh, you know, like the, the messianism that one encounters, you know, you must have this procedure, you must have that procedure, you must, you must at all costs postpone your death as long as you can, you must never say you're old. I mean, it's very difficult to even speak about being old. It's, it's astonishing how many people feel they have to rebuke me if I claim to be old, oh, you're not old. Oh, there's, a, there's a cure for that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah we're gonna, we'll soon fix that. Yeah. So, I mean, so I think we're, we're fully in the grips of it and all the details of COVID, right? The willingness to turn the world upside down, the, the panic, um, Yes, and I'll, I mean, I'll, I mean, actually, there's, there's a lot more to it than what I've said, but that's the one I'd like to. How about, but like, even I was so shocked, and I think you know. So I've just read Illich forever, but like, you would know of an Illich community of scholars. Now we both know those people like Barbara Dude and Wolfgang Sox and all these wonderful people. But you know, on your blog, and I would, you know, I'd lead people to it again, where Mike saw the the essay on romanticism, but uh, you know, concerning life that. People who've read Illich, there's a significant number of scholars that are taking umbrage with the way you and I would see it so obviously true. What do you what do you think about that? Wh where are they coming from? You know, are they? Well, uh, I'm I'm a, I'm a little mystified. You're, I think you're alluding to two people in particular. One is a a friend of mine, a, a, 
an Austrian German theologian, Wolfgang Palliver, uh, okay. who's at the University of Innsbruck, very much uh, a, a keen reader of Illich, but a, a very much a, an associate and acolyte of René Girard. And the other was Jean-Pierre Dupuy, who also spans a, a French okay. philosopher who spans between the Illich and Girard communities because he, he worked with Ivan during the period of medical nemesis. Mm. Um, but I think was had a, a deeper and more prolonged association with Chirin. But both were unhappy. They weren't sure with Illich, but certainly with, with the way I interpreted Illich. And above all, they were mad at Giorgio Agamben. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, was about to, I was about to mention for, him. For this. Yeah. And they... They claimed it was reckless, right? Wow. That that it. I think it, it, they said it was reckless. It, that's it, another. Because, that's another. Because you know, well, because safety. life yeah. is safety. life is life. We have to save it. We have to conserve it. We have to. Um, and that I that I was speaking recklessly. Now, <clears throat> I've never understood this in the sense that I don't. They don't seem able to count. They don't seem able, as Wendell Berry says, to subtract. Right? Mm -hmm. uh, yes, you're you're saving lives. The net, you know, the net by, yeah. by locking old people up and depriving them of their families and their loved ones. And this is this is good. Yeah, of, of uh, consolation, of this, consolation of any kind. This, this is, I mean. So I'm 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 bemused by it. I mean, I wrote an interminable essay that I think you yes, it was great. Read, yes. God bless you. Yeah. But uh, it on it. But I I remain fundamentally bemused. I don't I don't know why people can't count the costs mm -hmm. of what has been done in the last two years. Uh -huh. uh, and. And I think it must be fundamentally because they think it good. Yeah. The, if we're going to deal with the, if we're going to deal with climate change, we're going to need some sort of techno fascism. Mm -hmm. So let's get on with it. Now they wouldn't say it that way, and they certainly wouldn't speak of techno fascism. Yeah. But but they they a, a, an obedient population that that lives in fear of peril whether it's covid peril or mm. climate change peril or whatever is the peril of the moment um it seems like it must i mean it, it's certainly you can see that it was preparing for 20 30 and 40 years absolutely right absolutely to have risk consciousness to have the, the fear of climate change hanging over you without ever contemplating a, a change in your attitude, uh, right? That this is a management issue. Right. This is a question of quotas. This is a question of controls. This is a question, right? So all these things build up and I guess make it possible then for behind a, I would say a relatively severe, from what I can make out, a relatively severe epidemic of respiratory, you know, respiratory disease. <laughs> uh, it, 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 it may, when all is said and done and the counting is finished and people begin to recognize that a lot of COVID deaths were not really COVID deaths, um, Maybe it'll be a little bit north of 1958 in its severity, um, but it certainly will not be 1918-19. But it will; it'll have been a very serious epidemic. But locking everyone up, locking right. up the young and healthy, denying fundamental. Uh, 
Givens about about immunity, about right, uh, trying to completely overturn recognized science and vaccinology. So you you develop something in in less than a year, you barely test it, and then you proclaim that it's safe and effective, <clears throat> and no one can say the contrary. And you want to and, give it to babies. <laughs> discourage, yeah, and you start. I mean. I, I, I'm, it took my, this has taken my breath away. Taken my breath away. Mm -hmm. And it seems as if only the village idiots are willing to talk about it. I have two daughters who teach at school. <laughs> I've been in a, I've been in K through 12 environments recently, and I've been at the college. And again, I just don't know how it's that silent scream phenomenon, you know, that you, you don't know how to tell people the untold, you know, mental health damage you know that this oh, yeah. is done um the fear again downloaded i always say like an iv drip it just puts fear into people right um, and so only the improperly socialized yeah. speak up yeah and we know they're improperly socialized so yeah. we don't have to listen to them yeah right and we and we drive them constantly drive them further into into stories that they're, I would say, forced to make up about what's going on. It's all been planned by the World Economic Forum. Right. Because well, who, has, who has planned <laughs> Who has planned it? No wonder they're making up stories. Yeah. Right? What is well, the truth? Well, even when this started you know, a couple of years ago, I remember a remark and no, seeing my friends talk about it, my friends from academia, you know, saying, well, we're heading to pure state of exception territory with Giorgio Agamben. And then he came out with those few essays that he wrote. They were translated almost immediately. And I was surprised at how many people, I mean, intelligent, really intelligent people who were big Agamben people threw him under the bus. And all he did was kind of trace uh, what he said in in Homer Homo soccer and the state of exception yeah, yeah, and showing yeah. exactly what was happening is it would it was diagnostic it was not predictive, uh, right. but all of a sudden people didn't believe what they believed. <laughs> well, because yeah. yeah, I mean heresy is is different, right? It, it was interesting when it when when you didn't have any real world consequences. Yeah. Yeah, but suddenly it it's re it it's cast in a new light as heresy, and then you don't mm -hmm. want it anymore. Yeah, you see you, the implications. You don't want that. So you remember, don't touch your face. <laughs> yes. I, <laughs> How do you not touch your face? <laughs> <laughs> don't stand. All right, stand, gentlemen. Stand six feet away from yourself. Yeah. yeah. I'm going to have to go. So much okay. fun. So much fun. David Cayley. Let's do this every week. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We're definitely going to have you on again. We're going to put some, thank you so much. Put some weeks oh, behind us. Uh, David, oh, thank you so much. Well, I, I would be happy to, I'm happy to be included in the company of your sociologists. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and we'll, and we'll be happy to talk anytime. So yeah, we're going to, we're going to, we're going to get you uh, out of your vaccine imprisonment and we're going to get you down to Grass Lake, Michigan, and you're going to be one All of the right, guests well, in my yurt. All you right, can good. stay in the yurt. That's right. <laughs> All right. All right. Okay. Well, thank you, everybody, for listening to the Regeneration Podcast with our guest, David Cayley. Michael Martin, we'll see you here next week with another right. exciting interview. Take care. Take care, everybody. God bless. Bye-bye.